Oh, good, good, good. Oh, great. Good. Hi, Jen. Hi, Andy. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, great to see you. So we're just coming in to the room. Uh, there you go. Just going to give people uh, a bit of time to kind of come in the room. Uh, make sure you say hi, everybody. Uh, there we go. Uh, good. How are we getting on? Brilliant. Good. Great. Well, uh, we've both come back from holidays, Jen, which is great, isn't it? So we're both Apparently we're supposed to be kind of recharged and that kind of thing, but it doesn't take much after a holiday, does it, to make you kind of feel like you need another holiday? Yeah, it definitely does. I, I feel like, was I really there? <laughs> yeah. It's a very profound thing you said there, because, of course, the only thing that really matters is the moment, right? It's sitting right. here having a chat now, you know? Um, hi, Tina. Hi, all oh, good people coming in now. That's great. Uh, good. So we've got the wonderful, wonderful uh, Jen Triok with us this evening, and I've been really looking forward to this, Jen. There's a lot for us to try and squeeze into this hour. It's going to fly by, I think. Yeah. Uh, we'll just wait for more of, for other people just to come in in the room. And um, just what we're doing now, just a general thing. Hi, Jessica. Nice to see you. Uh, just a general thing, really. I, I had a really lovely email, Jen, from a caregiver who posted in the group a little while ago. I thought I'd leave a little bit of a gap yeah. from that yeah. post and, and said, is it okay if I show it? But um, just saying how... Um, the, she put a post in the group and she had a lot of amazing responses beyond the normal training ideas, uh, which she'd actually tried anyway. Uh, and it's just been so transformative for her dogs. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody in the group because I just love how people are just so generous with their comments and uh, uh, and the vast majority of people in the group are um, you know, write right in a very kind, compassionate way. And I think it's really wonderful. Uh, so that's where these groups start to work. You know, we can all get a bit... Um, you know, a little bit uh, kind of anti-social media sometimes for good reason, but but when it works, it's good. Yeah, absolutely. It's so great to have that community, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and people, especially other caregivers who, who have had you, I hear you. Yeah. And those comments, which is like, you know, I'm, I don't know what to say from a technical point of view, but I just want to say that I hear you and I feel what you've, what you're expressing. That's sometimes the most powerful thing, right? Sure. Absolutely. People really want to feel heard. They definitely do. They want to feel heard. Right. Uh, great. Hi, Susie. Hi, Alice. Great. Hi, everybody. OK, so we're going to. Um, do, it's, it's interesting. I share a lot of stuff, Jen, in the group from some of the more progressive side of child educational psychology and development. And I quote people from, you know, clinical social workers or um, you know, child clinical psychologists. And there's something that comes up in the group a lot, and and uh, and uh, and I I hear when people say, you know, what's that got to do with dogs? Yeah. What's what's kids got to do with dogs? Yeah. Um, and actually everything, right? And that's what hopefully we're going to kind of look at tonight a little bit. So let's start off as we always do, uh, Jen, giving people listening just a chance for you to, to say a little bit about um, what you do um, currently. And then we're going to dial back in time a little bit and we're going to hear your story because it's a fascinating one. And there's so many component parts, Jen, of your own kind of origin stories, uh, as I call them, that are just so foundational to how you've ended up with this outlook and this this really beautiful um, way that you look at uh, working with dogs and kids. Well, thank you. Well, um, thank you for inviting me. I'm a certified dog behavior consultant. I also have a degree in special education and elementary education. And uh, I started this career um, over 20 years ago, um, focusing on dog and baby child safety and dynamics. Um, it's an important niche and one that's a lot overlooked really overlooked, which is why I'm so grateful that we're going to have this conversation today. And um, because it's such an important niche, it really is. And um, so Family Paws began 20 years ago, we've got over 250 licensed educators all around the world. And I'm very proud of that and to mentor dog professionals to learn a bit about dogs and kids. I think a lot of times that people can kind of shy away from it a little bit, you know, especially infants and toddlers. And I want to really encourage people not to, um, because it's a critical period. It's such a critical, important period. And I hope that that's what we discover and talk about today is yeah. why that's important. Yeah. 
And then I, I guess the other thing is I'm a mother of four. Um, they're grown. So um, I can't believe it. 27, 25, 22, and 13. And then I've got two dogs, a shepherd and a collie, and I've got five cats and two guinea pigs. Can't forget them. <laughs> so. Wow. So you, you've achieved all this stuff, um, uh, Jen, but whilst also being mom uh, and mom to four kids, right? So that's uh, definitely Superwoman Award for you on, on, uh, on doing all these kind of things. So, uh, so let, let's start back a little bit then. And, um, and by the way, I know, uh, I know your influences and your kind of voice is heard very widely because I know over here in the UK, we've got the wonderful Debbie, Debbie Luckin doing her kids around dogs. And I know that she credits you on a lot of things. Um, uh, and it's amazing when you start these things, you know, 20 years ago, wow, I just think, well, society was so different, but let alone the dog industry, the dog training community. So I think that's something to unpack in a minute, just to kind of think about your own observations of that development. But if we dial back a little bit more then, um, uh, I'm really interested in your, your own early experiences and how you ended up coming into starting off with a career of working in child education, especially um, uh, for children with um with differing needs especially those who are i'm guessing verbal pre-verbal or non-verbal uh as part of that. So. yeah but let's start back as far back as you want to go jen it's oh goodness end. so i can go back as far as uh my early childhood my mother was a, a teacher and developed um i'm legally blind so my mother actually created a lot of different um uh materials for me I was I benefited from her creating tactile books and all sorts of things that I cherish and still have to this day. Um, and she became uh, really focused. She developed a whole new career after I, I was adopted and um, part of her family and she saw my visual uh, needs. And then she actually got excited about all different you know, abilities and developed a, a program for children with autism. And I ended up, you know, as kids do, volunteering or going to her school on some half days. And I really loved the opportunity to sit and be assigned uh, a task with an, a student and, and have her say, all right, I want you to get from point A to Z. and." Uh, have at it. <laughs> and I credit her. I must have been, I mean, I was young, you know, I was really young. I was, I was um, a little older than the, the students and um, because they were all preschool and, and younger. And I really enjoyed this. And I actually credit her for my behavior consulting ability and skills, because I think that that really opened up my eyes. Um, from that point on, I will say I wanted to be a teacher, always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I, teacher and dogs, I've always been obsessed. So um, a couple of things that are kind of funny is I used to play school with all my stuffed dogs. I still have my chair set and I used to use dittos back in the day. Um, that's dating me definitely that no one knows what a ditto is now, but we used to make ditto sheets and I would make different activities for all my school stuffed animals. Um, and uh, everybody knew me as the dog kid, you know, because I grew up in a house with six dogs and I, I Goldens and Cavaliers and um, I just love dogs and showed dogs and junior showmanship and, and confirmation and obedience. And um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about my background. I just, um, you know, from there, I knew I always was the person who knew what I wanted to do when I grew up. Boy, I fooled myself, though. <laughs> I always said I wanted to work with children and dogs. And that was always my dream. And I thought it was going to be look a lot different than it does. But um, I went to school and I got my degree in special education. I worked throughout my school time in group homes and intermediate care facilities with all different age range um, uh, and, and love that. And um, yeah, and then when I decided to become a mother, I wanted to figure out what I could do from home and kind of what I could do 
on my own. And that's really where Family Pause began was what can I do? I don't drive, so I couldn't be a doula. I wanted to be a doula. Um, I've always volunteered with new parents, expecting families. And so just one day it all really came in after so many, um, you know, volunteering hours with German Shepherd Rescue, which was my passion also too early on. And uh, one of the volunteer jobs that I had was to answer phone calls. And I'll just tell you, there were so many phone calls from expectant families or families that had a toddler and they were scared. They didn't know what to do or should they rehome their dog or should they, you know, work with their dog or what to do, or maybe a bite has happened and, and different things. So anyway, I combined I feel really, really grateful because I was able to combine my passions, all my passions, supporting new and expecting families, um, working with children and working with dogs and supporting, supporting them all. And so that's kind of how I came to be. So that's really interesting. So from an early um, age, then, really, you were exposed to <clears throat> um, because of the work of your mother and and some of your own uh, kind of um, challenges uh, yeah. that you were exposed to at an early age, different different forms of learning, different different forms of what safety might look like, different uh, ideas of of an individual's care and support needs that might come out of that conformist norm. Yes. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it was definitely an experience growing up with albinism, um, the lack of pigment, and that is what causes me to have the visual impairment. Um, and so having those differences in a, you know, regular school um, environment was always, you know, eye opening, um, literally, um, and uh, taught me quite a few things. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes I felt rather safe in that learning environment and other times I really didn't feel safe in that learning environment. Um, there were people who were willing to, uh, you and I were talking just a little bit ahead of time. When you're visually impaired, you're not quite the expectation of what people think is blind. I'm considered legally blind, um, but I see, and it can be confusing for people. And um, there were some in the in my elementary school and even you know high school who didn't quite um, understand that, and so thought maybe I wasn't doing my best because um, you know they would think I was pulling one over on them or something. It was it was kind of an interesting thing. So my learning environment definitely wasn't always a safe space. It definitely wasn't because um, sometimes. I could even be challenged on, well, can't you see this? You could see this. Why can't you see this? <laughs> um, things like that. It was often very, very stressful for me in the learning environment. And this is really important, actually. I think we'll just we'll just um, stay on this, if, if that's okay, yeah. Jen. Because yeah. I think this sums up a lot about the the friction between task and care, the friction between... Uh, a structured learning environment which is heavily focused on attainment um uh the amazing mandy wilson gave a chat in the group about the learning experience and, and those different things between attainment and achievement yeah and recognizing that for many kids just being in that classroom today is an achievement even though they're hungry even though they didn't sleep last night even though whatever you know and i think uh when we push towards an attainment, a, a kind of a, a single criteria-based goal, uh, then without understanding the individual's ability in the moment to be able to do that, process that way, learn that way, cope that way, we just end up disenfranchising and, and disadvantaging. And and we and you can make the parallel. You know, this conversation today is, you know, kids and dogs. You know, what, what's the what's the difference? What's the connection? This is another one because I see the same with dogs, right? Some of these dogs who, especially some of my clients, uh, the dogs who are particularly, you know, they're a bit more sensitive or a bit more sensorily defensive. Yeah, just, being, just being in that village hall is an achievement. 
but yeah. they can't then go on and do a certain things. And then the problem when you have a very task oriented approach is that it can lead to a, a sense of blame. Mm. Uh, you know, either the teacher feels I'm not good enough because they're not getting it, uh, or the child feels I'm not good enough because I can't do it. Um, <clears throat> uh, or in the case of um, the dogs or, or the children, the, the caregiver, the parent feels that they're not good enough because they're yeah. not doing it. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because I think about my IEP and I think about the things that were provided for me that were supposed to help, right? And how how infrequent anybody actually said, is this helping you? <laughs> is this actually helping you? Or is this actually leading to more stress in your environment? Um, you know, and I think about when I'm working with dogs, I do think about all the different sensory issues, you know, and and um, or when working with children, when going in a home with young children, wow, the sensory issues and the different things, you know, when we're working with a family, um, taking into consideration that each child, you know, you've got to look at the dog in front of you, but you also have to look at each of the individuals in the family in front of you. And um, there might be one child out of four or three that has a sensory issue that that says, you know, I'm not really interested in touching and feeling a dog. Um, I'm not that that fur just feels like pins and needles on my skin, you know, or the saliva or breathing of a dog is disgusting, you know, they can't tolerate it. And so um, we have to take that into consideration in our, in our plans and our games and how we might structure something and be observant to those things, because that is incredibly important to take all the learners in, into consideration and make sure that everybody's feeling comfortable, as comfortable as possible. I think I love that so much. Um, and it's powerful because in any in any given situation, you have multiple nervous systems with their with their own um history, their own traumas. Remember that you could you you potentially got adults as well who are a victim themselves of being misunderstood, being pigeonholed, being labeled, having to come up with all sorts of life coping strategies that actually aren't particularly appropriate or effective a lot of the time. Uh, and we have to navigate that. And I think especially the, the sensory thing, I think is important because uh, we know that a high percentage of children actually like to have sensory processing sensitivity of some sort, um, which can settle down more when the brain is, is fully formed and they, be, and they mature. But, but we know the same about dogs more now, you know, in the same way, some of these dogs who are like, I, I really can't cope with the feeling of that harness on me. I really don't like the sensation of the hairbrush going through. Uh, so it's another connection, isn't it? It's another connection we can make about Absolutely. Um, uh, what they need to do. And especially when they're in a more elevated state, those the ability for that sensory integration process. So sensory integration is, for those listening who might not know that term, but it's just where our brain takes on information through the sensory system and then has to sort it all out. And what's interesting is for us adult humans um, uh, within the abstract normal, whatever that is, range, uh, a huge percentage of that is done subconsciously because otherwise it would be you, you'd just go crazy, wouldn't you, if you had to be aware of everything. But you know what? The more sensitive you are, the more anxious you are, the more generally dysregulated you are anyway to for whatever reason even just feeling poorly or under the weather you do become more aware you are more sensorily defensive about stuff and you can get overwhelmed really quickly yeah absolutely i just went through um an airport and you know and it's funny i was talking to someone someone was saying oh do you listen to like ear earbuds on the airplane i said only one i only listen to one because i can't i can't tolerate having two on my ears and not having the visual, you know, I need to have all, you know, only a certain amount of that kind of stimuli. When I'm in a highly visual environment, I need to be as, have my ears as available as possible, you know? And, you know, I think about that with our dogs who, um, you know, are coming out of shelters, coming out of environments that are so, you know, they haven't been exposed to a lot of different things and they come from maybe, um, you know, a kennel situation into the home situation. And I'm thinking, whoa, you've got the floor, you've got the smells, you've got, I have a dog who's very scent um, 
uh, like she sneezes and she reacts to sprays in, in a way that um, not all dogs do, but she definitely does. And it's, um, it's, you know, she'll even tuck her tail and be like, Ooh, that's really offensive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a hairspray or something like that. Um, so we have to, we have to modify for that, but being familiar with all these things um, really helps you in your, in your, you know, when you go to support a family or support a dog, because, you know, the more that you're aware of it, the more that you're able to adapt and build around it and kind of, you know, cushion that for um, the environment, you know, cushion the environment for the dog and, and the people as well. And, and it just making them aware that your dog has these sense sensitivities. Um, I think a lot of people don't think about it. They think about the human sensitivities and we might be able to relate to that, but we don't think about it from our dog side. We just think, oh, our dog's going to be able to do everything. And um, we've got to really connect those more. We do. And I think we need to talk about it more because I think what happens is just from a psychological point of view, because a lot of what we process sensorily is or is subconscious, it's just happening. Yeah. Um, we only end up becoming aware of the things that we find uncomfortable. Um, and we're not necessarily putting a lot of cognitive thought into that. It's just a case of uh, I've got a family member who, if they're on public transport, like a train or a plane or something, there's something about their left arm. They don't want it touching anything. Mm. So uh, especially next to a person, they their right one, they can. It's it's their thing, you know, and it's, so they're very but because of that, I think, and because we are not. As, especially as adults, we're, we're less attuned to the subtle changes around us. Um, it's hard to understand it in another person. We tend to dismiss it. Mm. Oh, that's silly. You're being silly. Yeah. Uh, you know, pull yourself together or, you know, it's only that or it's only this. And, and, and so it can be difficult to raise awareness because we're, we're not attuned to it, especially then saying, Do you know what, maybe this dog is struggling because you're using artificial perfume in your home. In the, in the form of air sense, which is one thing that my husband and I have, have made a big point of doing the last few years is to get rid of all the artificial stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think Arthur, who's our very sensitive dog, he's our colleague, he, um, he's more available in the environment now, interestingly, whereas he would just disappear off to stuff. But for some of these dogs, especially when they're already in quite a stressed state um, and that nervous system's already a little bit all over the place, to come into a new home, they're being bombarded. Their senses are being bombarded, right? Oh, absolutely. It's funny that you say it's your collie. It's my collie too. <laughs> um, what a surprise. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're be being bombarded. And then I think about how do we know they're being bombarded? How do we know? How do we want people to recognize this? And this goes back to, you know, infants and dogs and what do they have in common? We know through their body language, right? We pay attention to recognizing their, their, their body language, how they're communicating to us. What are they doing? Are they sneezing? Are they shaking their head off? Or what are the, how are they responding? And, you know, I think about, um, you know, I talk about this a lot in our class and our course about infants also show discomfort and often aren't paid attention to because it's all nonverbal. And young children and toddlers often aren't heard because it's nonverbal communication and we need to pay attention to the body language of these young dog lovers potentially um, so that we don't create fear or we don't we don't potentially um, overwhelm them with sensory things you know so we might have a child who can't communicate that they're uncomfortable I think about this with um, I'm going down a different tangent, I think, but I, I think about this with infants. Okay. So most people want to introduce their dog and baby. And I talk a lot about this, that I, I prefer to think of it as a homecoming over a three month period, that it's a gradual inclusion without direct physical interaction. There's no need for a dog to be right in the face of an infant. And if we look at the infants, we will see them grimace. We will see them make faces and have tongue movement and blink their eyes and do these things when a dog is right up in their face. And we have to take that just because they're not 
verbally communicating discomfort doesn't mean that it's comfortable, you know? Um, and I think this is true with dogs too. Um, a lot of times we'll, we'll not pay attention to what they're, they're speaking, they're saying, you know, because we don't know. And that's one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate and I'm so grateful the community is much more of an advocate for body language and recognition of subtle signals and communication. And the more that we can understand nonverbal communication, the better. But I often think that infants and children, young children are kind of disregarded, um, not taken seriously, um, when they do respond in an uncomfortable way, much like our dogs are, um, we kind of say, oh, it'll be okay. Or he's, he likes that. And, you know, um, you know, so I think about the dog who is out on a walk and these new, these children want to greet them and the dog is doing everything it possibly can to say, no, thank you. No, thank you. Licking its lips, turning away, head shake, all the things and the person is feeling that social pressure to say, sure, my dog loves kids and allow a child close. Um, you know, it's that disregard for what the animal is communicating in the only way they know how. And, and I think that um, that happens a lot with infants and toddlers as well, that, that the communication is disregarded, you know, or not seen um, and, and, you know, I just think it's really important that we pay as much attention as we can. Yeah, and when we think about doing really good observations, it is quite an art, really, because you have to do, you have to observe without judgment or label. You have to just allow things to, to, to see what you see and, and put those little question marks, as Sarah Fisher says, and think, oh, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, that's the third time I've seen that in that context. Maybe that's something I need to really look into because while we have a, a reasonable body of work now regarding body language, dog body language, sure. there are always going to be extra things that are likely to be a quirky thing for that dog that we might miss. And also dogs like the young kids, especially not so much babies, but definitely kind of infants, the need to please the the kind of wanting of approval and acceptance can be a big mask actually for actually being able to feel I would sooner not, but I kind of feel I have to. And especially through right. a training operation with dogs specifically, they can end up following a route through because they've been reinforced for it, but it might sure. not necessarily be something they feel comfortable with. With um, uh, I've talked about this before, the, the notion of safety, I think is a, is a good one to think about here because we tend to have a big bias when we think about safety of another of physical safety mm. because, because that's what our brain can get feedback from you know so right. this is physically safe uh, and especially if you're doing work say with um pens or gates or whatever you think well physically we're safe so we're okay and but actually we know that our own brains are um just as and if not more attuned to emotional safety and social safety a lot of the things we know about um, uh, kind of a, uh, attachment theory and, that, and, that, and that thinking about things through those kind of lenses shows that from a really young age, we want to safely socially connect to another because that's actually how we get fed, how we get looked after and everything else. So this is something important when we just think about safety. It has to be felt by the individual. The wonderful Rachel Leather, who, who does a lot of work on trauma, says that you can't teach safety because the person or the dog has to feel it. And that really underpins what you're saying here about this thing that we've got to be available enough to look at those little things and see everything as feedback, 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 for us to be able to progress in a way that both of these very vulnerable nervous systems are feeling safe. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really, really important. I, I think about it all the time. You know, when I see these videos of... Um, dogs up close to say a three month old, who's kind of making a face and, and scrunching up and, and scrunching their shoulders, you know, at the closeness of the dog. And I think, hmm, is that going to be a five-year-old that the family is so concerned and doesn't understand why their child's terrified of dogs, why mm -hmm. their, their child, you know, and I get those calls quite a bit. Might that be a child who is, is exposed so early and, and is giving 
feedback that that is uncomfortable and it's being missed. And, and then, you know, no one understands why the child is, is so fearful of dogs or doesn't like the touch of dogs or everybody else in the family loves dogs, but they don't, um, you know, it, it does make me wonder about some of those situations, you know? And also if we break down, um, this is part of uh, something that I, I, I frame in some of my talks when working with um in inverted commas aggressive dogs um if you if you look at breaking down the foundations of feeling safe you've got processing which is the ability to process something in a way that you feel safe doing i'll come back to processing in a minute because it feeds back in um and then engagement what does engagement need to be for you physical engagement emotional engagement social engagement and then exit mm. where is available exit a, a lot of trauma, if not all trauma, really, is kind of based in lack of agency over engagement and exit. So you can imagine a young child who's like, okay, I'm quite happy to share this space with this dog I'm processing, but the they're under a lot of pressure to pet it. So yeah. the engagement is the thing that is sending that nervous system into a place of feeling unsafe now. And the thing is, the information that we learn through engagement and exit feeds back into what we need to process and how more and more skewed and the filters through which that processing now has to go through. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think about absolutely. And when you think about this, um, you know, newly crawling babies, right. For example, let's, let's take that for example here, they don't have an ability to exit if they can't move. Right. So they're, they're in a position, you know, so you've got, maybe a dog or you've got a dog who can't exit, you know, can't, maybe they have a physical condition that they can't exit when it's a crawling baby. Um, you know, so we have to consider both of those things. Maybe the dog has some physical pain and they can't necessarily exit when there's a newly crawling baby. This is one of the areas that we run into the most conflict with infants, you know, children and dogs is that that stage. So, you know, I think of it both ways. I think of the child who is on the floor having tummy time and maybe the dog is wandering around or is, is not behind a gate or is not, you know, on the other side of the parent. And um, that child can't get away. They can't physically move away. They might grunt and they might try to move away, but they can't get away. So you have that. And so what are they? you know, processing. And then the dog who has a situation where they can't physically get away, you know, a lot of people say, but he didn't get up and move. Maybe he couldn't, or maybe everything in the room was such of, of importance, this being close to his trusted adults, that um, it was more important for him to stay close, right, than to get up and leave. So there's, there's so many things to think about there, you know, from both sides. into the small baby um just before that, actually the thing about exits uh a lot of behavioral challenges come when the brain perceives there is no exit mm. you know, that dog who uh you know runs over to another dog and starts barking and then runs away again why run over in the first place you know, why why do that and, and often it's that perceived thing of the brain thinking you know, i've got a history here of engagement happening when i'm not ready for it uh, and and I can't exit. And um, when you think about some uh, things like dis disassociative um, uh, presentations, when you think about things like maybe submissive urination with dogs, yep. potentially it's a case of the fact that that nervous system feels I can't exit, you know, even though you, you could. And this is the thing about trauma, of course. Trauma creates a story about no exit when when there could be you know, the reality could be one. Uh, because I knew we were going to be talking tonight, I was looking through some articles online. Um, that we're kind of discussing this thing about babies, about how it's a relatively new thing that's being understood now, that we mm -hmm. used to think, well, they, they didn't have the brain function to necessarily learn much. They're just this goo goo gaga, -ga, you know, eat, burp, right. and poop machine. But actually what the evidence seems to be showing now is that they are highly sensorily attuned to their environment. Uh, yeah. through touch, through kind of the sensory, in, the sensory impact of things, the vibrations even. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really fascinating because that connects exactly with what you're saying. We perceive the babies on the floor wriggling about, the dogs walking about, everything's fine. We just don't know what that 
uh, and that sensory sensory sensitivity for the for the newborn baby is directly related to what that nervous system is taking on board. So you can totally see then why jumping forwards to a to a young child who now might be three or four who seems to have this fear for one of a better word of dogs. Yeah, it's that nervous system that has decided that quite a while ago, even yeah. though the brain has developed in a different way. It's it's really fascinating, I think. The potential is definitely there, and I mean, you know, I think that um, you know, I, again infants take in so much they really do they just take in everything um you know i know myself um i i had a traumatic experience of being that i was legally blind and i had i have nystagmus so my eye muscles don't want to stay still which is troubling and and you know difficult at time but anyway as an infant and i was um in foster care uh, the the doctors at that time thought that putting contact lenses in my eyes at one month would be a good idea to see if this helped with the nystagmus. So you can imagine being a one month old infant being held down by my, what I'm what I'm told were about you know four or five adults to put lenses in the eyes, right? Um, that situation that experience i can say stays with me i um several years ago i want to say when i was about more than several years ago but maybe seven years ago i had um, a sty in my eye and uh i went to the doctor and um they talked about that they would need to remove this sty, and i immediately I, I've never had panic attacks in my life that I know of, but I had to wait three months to have this procedure done. And the panic that it created for me at the thought of someone holding my eye open, the, the panic that it brought into me, you know, in my 40s from this situation, um, you know, and all the sensitivities I've had over the years with my eyes, you know. Um, it just was unreal. I didn't have words. I had trembling. I had crying. I had all sorts of reactions that I myself stepped back and was, you know, I love behavior. So I'm going, I'm really losing it. You know, like I'm really, I'm really responding to this and, but, but I don't have any memory of it. I don't remember those things, but it was traumatic for me. Um, mm. it was very traumatic for me. And any time that I have anything coming to my eye, it's, 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 it's a really big procedure process to be able to control that. And I would say, I can't control my physical response to it at all. The, the panic that I feel, and obviously that's traumatic for, you know, it would be for anybody, but I think about that. And I just think about these situations. And I think this is one of the reasons why I am so passionate because with infants and toddlers, we run into dog bite situations. And a lot of times when an incident has happened there, people will always say often, often, I would say, sadly, it is almost always the kid's fine. The child is fine. They've moved on. Okay. But did they? Do they have the words to communicate what they're experiencing? Do they have the ability to communicate what they're experiencing? If you're talking about a 10 month old or even a two year old or even a four year old, you know, have they communicated, you know, after they've been stitched up and, and you know, move fixed, so to speak. Um, it scares me because I see a lot of adults when they hold their newborn who have fear that they don't remember, they don't know why they're being triggered, but they're holding their newborn baby and their dog's coming close and they're, they're trembling, they're shaking. They have a fear of this dog to a serious, serious degree. Interesting enough, a lot of times when we question about their childhood and their previous experience, there is a bite history. There may not be a history that they know about, or maybe their parent hadn't told them, but there is sometimes that history there. But it's, you know, I just think the connection, you know, being aware of these things that, you know, the, these kiddos are experiencing a situation. 
And if there is a negative situation with a dog, it's not always, I, I don't think it's that quick and easy, fast fix. I think that, um, which is why I'm so big on prevention, because I want to prevent those situations, because I do think that that leads to, for some, not for everybody, that potential fear down the road um, that is unexplained and maybe not even, you know, maybe not even recognized because they did so well recovery wise as it looked. Am I making sense here? Yeah. It's powerful and, it, and, it, and it, there's just so many things that come from that because one thing that we kind of see as ourselves as being as different as a species, and, and this is the key, this is the key, is our huge kind of prefrontal cortex, our, our big thinking brain, um, you know, our ability to have this kind of uh, philosophical outlook on behavior and the ability to kind of control drives and instincts and, and be civilized, all these kind of things that we think about. But what we're hearing here is that that part of the brain doesn't get a look in. Yeah. Uh, with this deep nervous system driven uh, kind of connection to safety or potential or the perceived lack of. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful because then, and if we're thinking now about the potential for such early experiences, you know, people think, what happened? I don't think my child ever had a bad experience around a child because they're thinking from when they were walking and talking and, and being physically safe. They don't think something as surly as that can have that effect that the, the um your own kind of story you, you shared about what happened when you were just that very young baby yeah. trying to have those complex men. so when we think about flipping back to dogs again then for these dogs who are already potentially more uh social um sensorily sensitive yeah. especially for six to 12 months what is actually happening to their perception of connection, physical, tactile yeah. connection through their senses to the outside world? And especially these poor dogs uh, who end up with horrendous collars stuck on them and all sorts of stuff on them. But, but even just dogs yeah. where there's a heavy obedience compliance component about, no, you've got to behave like this, you've got to behave like this, you've got to behave like this, where there's no chance for that nervous system to find some right. form of panel to connect to. Yeah, it, it, it is so important to consider and, and think about. And um, I know that, you know, one of the things that we're really, obviously, we, we talk about, um, you know, th that importance of positive exposure always when it comes to interaction and engaging, because those children are, are viewing everything that parents and people are modeling in front of them, and they're taking that in. Um, you know, so we want to always be having that positive experience as much as possible, you know, because these, these infants and babies are little sponges. I mean, I think about, um, you know, how early sign language is, is used. We used it in our early intervention class. You know, I had um, a class of toddlers um, and, you know, we always use sign language to int introduce and begin communication. Um, I used it with my children. Um, it was extremely helpful pre-verbal language. Um, mm. But, um, you know, and, and we use that in our program to engage and, you know, connect the dog and the child um, in some ways. But yeah, I mean, there's so many, so many things. And I think uh, we put another emphasis on when we think about that kind of, I say, having positive experiences and, and that kind of thing. We can, with our dogs and with our young children, think that that has to be about positive engagement. Whereas, in fact, often it's about giving them the chance to process in a way that they need to. Yeah. Uh, and engagement doesn't have to be about physical engagement it can just be how you choose to engage mentally emotionally with a situation and I think about things like um I don't know a, I don't, a, a young child teenager maybe who's up in their room and a relative comes around and it's like you must come down you know oh. you come down. 
Whereas potentially that child feels socially more safe up there, but now they're being forced into engagement and what that says to the individual really about the kind of agency over engagement. But I think we do this a lot with, with dogs when they're puppies going out, meeting lots of people, doing lots of things. And somehow the dog has to physically engage with stuff to learn something. Whereas in fact, you know, when we brought Molly up, um, she's our young dog, uh, because she was so sensitive when she came to us, uh, we just, she took a lot of her engagement from from the processing of mm. and then the kind of connection through that more like social engagement than actually just being part of it all the time. Yeah. And this same, is same with kids. Mm. Yeah, it's really important. So, you know, when families bring that new puppy home, you know, to talk about these things that the dog might need some space and, and even the children need some space and thinking about both mm. of the needs. Um, because the puppy is overstimulating in many ways with their teeth and paws and that kind of thing. And parents or, or even a new rescue dog, how much, you know, how many people want to bring that dog home and immediately just expose it to everything, you know, plop it in the back seat with the kids in the car and away they go. And I'm thinking nobody here is comfortable and, and definitely you don't have an exit there in that car seat kind of situation. Um, but you know, thinking about those things and thinking, what can we do to make this more comfortable, safe and and yeah. get, allow everybody to have their comfort level? I think about that situation with family. I remember, oh, my goodness, the dinner table when my aunt and uncle and everybody would come over and we would have to, as little kids, go around and give everybody a hug at night. And I hated it. I just, you know, I cringed. And I, I think about the dog that you know, is going to a new home and everybody's so happy and wants to hug it and kiss it and give it all this affection because the poor thing has been rescued and, um, and, and the dog that's going, no, thank you, please. No, thank you. That's not comfortable for me. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, and then the child could be saying, I'm not comfortable with this dog right off the bat either. Um, you know, so it's it really does take everybody to pay attention and and honor those feelings. This is because of the friction between the perceived need for dogs and kids to be molded into some form of societal norm to suit society. So, uh, you know, you must come and be sociable because that's the thing to do. You must do this. with them. And the, the question I would ask is, as a society, how's that working for us? Right. We've got huge members, uh, huge numbers with emotional health needs, social anxiety needs, um, uh, and actually to be what society needs us to be, to turn up and, and fit that, is easier if you are able to do that through choice, because yeah. you have the coping mechanisms, because when you were young, you were able to say no when you wanted to do and yes when you wanted to. And actually, I think it's, we need to be brave in that. This is what we've done with Molly, you know, we didn't introduce her to loads of people men with beards men with sticks and I'm not saying that's not the way to do it but for her the most important thing for her was to help her to feel safe and that my husband and I were her return to safety if you like but also that we would learn what her processing engagement and exit preferences were and try and set up environments so she could keep doing that so actually she didn't need to meet loads of people because she'd learned something more fundamental which is regardless of who I meet or what situation, I will have time to process it and I'll engage if I want to or not. And that builds huge resilience over time, actually. Yeah. They're, they're not the way around, um, you know? Yeah, and I can choose to leave if I need to. I can, I can allow myself space if I need to. That's so incredibly important. I see the social pressure put on young children. In fact, I even saw it with my own child, um, you know, to, to even, you know, people walking their dogs who are like, oh, you want, you know, does your kid want to say hello? And my daughter would blow a kiss because that's what we taught. We taught blow a kiss instead of approach. And we taught mm -hmm. that from a very early age and, and, you know, blow a kiss wave, but we're not going to approach the dog. Um, and so, you know, I actually had a neighbor who pushed her dog close to my child. And I said, actually, no, we're good. We're good. But that's social pressure for all parties, you know, um, you know, she almost thought we were being insulting. How could we not want to pet her beloved dog? And my daughter was thinking, wait, this isn't what we do. I don't want to, my daughter backed up and the dog is thinking, holy cow, you know, so mm -hmm. it just, 
there's so much pressure in those situations, you know, but often there isn't that escape. You know, I see a lot of dogs that are sat and, and sit and stay while the children come and engage with them. And they're just doing everything they can to say, no, thank you. I, I need out of this. Um, you know, but it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, Jen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all kids in school were taught that when you see a dog, just blow them a kiss? Yeah. It would be wonderful. Because a lot of the things that do get taught in school, which is like, you know, don't approach uh, dogs you don't know, but you speak to a responsible adult and get them to act. It's still about trying to make engagement happen without consent. Um, when we had Molly, when she was younger, um, this little I saw this little boy running over. His mom was sat on a bench with a baby in a pushchair, and he came running over and he was like, "All right, Mister." Uh, um, I probably didn't say that, but you know, what I mean? but can I can I pet your dog? And I'm like, "Sorry, no, we're we're doing some training, but thank you for asking. I really appreciate it." Uh, so he said, "All oh, right, okay." Fine. And he ran back, and then about I don't know, ten minutes later or so, the lady had caught up with us. She was all out of breath because she'd been running to catch up with us, and then she had a go at me for not allowing her child to pet uh. the dog. And I, and I said to her, "Look, you know, it's really important that." we teach consent to young children, especially young boys about, you know, sometimes no means we can't today, you know, but, uh, but it was just the kind of entitledness. Yes. And, but, but, but it was the same with my mother, bless her, right, Jen, my late mother. She was just, she was just the mother of everybody, right? You know, the number of, um, of my ex-partners back in the day that I'd end up you know, splitting up with and then I'd come home one day and find they're at home having Sunday lunch with her because she still wanted to be everybody's mom it's just rude but that's just my mom but she was of that generation where she would go up to a child and she'd tweak their cheek and she'd give them uh, a kiss and even if the baby's crying it's like oh it's okay you know that kind of thing and it's it's crazy when when we think about it what we do routinely without thinking about these things yeah no it absolutely is it absolutely is. There was something with that story that you were saying that I was thinking, and now it's it's slept my mind. Um, but that that often happens that going up and um, now I forgot I forgot what I was going to say as you were talking. I was thinking of something. I, okay. I think I think I so the point that really was about it works both ways. People just want to come. Even even um, it amazed me when Molly was a pup. How many people don't even ask? They're just going to come and touch your dog. And even the ones who do it, luckily Molly was a blonde lab. So a lot of people were like, oh, is it a guide dog in training? And we just ended up saying yes in the end just to get people to, because they're like, oh yeah, I understand. But the point with my mother is we do it the other way around, especially with babies and infants. I think there were um, a mother, my mother of her generation, they would just go up to a baby. They couldn't not go to a baby. Uh, so it's, there is that side of it. And it's not um, through any malice or, horribleness it's because they loved them right but even if that baby was screaming its lungs out yeah. mom would still tweak that cheek uh, and, uh, my daughter would have my daughter just wasn't that baby you know definitely yeah. wasn't that baby um and that was the other thing since when do we trust a stranger to ask them if they can if if we can pet their dog you know i, I keep thinking like there's mm. a in that whole line you know you're asking a stranger since when can we do we want our children to be asking a stranger questions? You know, I just, I, anyway, it's just kind of a flaw in the system. I just think I like the blow a kiss and I, I, you know, and, and, and the no, thank you, you know, if, if they do get to that point where they're petting or, you know, pet, pet, pause, see if the dog actually wants to continue in that engagement. My cat taught me that. I credit my cat because I would pet him twice and that third one was a little left. <laughs> um, and, but, but it's so, it's so important. And, um, but yeah, my daughter would have been screaming because she definitely wasn't one who wanted people. All my children were, were not comfortable with that kind of engagement. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, but they're, but they're kids. So we expect them to be, you know? We have the, we put our own expectations on them. And I think stepping back and saying, let's, let's really take into consideration what they're communicating, you know. And also when we hear things that <clears throat> like, um, oh, it can't do them any harm. It never did me any harm. Just by saying that shows that it kind of did do harm. You know, I know when I was at school here in the UK in the seventies, we still had the cane. 
and the slipper. Uh, I, I had sexualized trauma when I was very young with a non-family member that affected me hugely. And I felt I couldn't talk to my parents about it, which is which is what happens. And and it affected my schooling. But then all the school teachers saw was now a little Andy being naughty and being disruptive. So I got the cane because they were looking at things from a very task oriented, you know, very kind of black and white point of view, really. And that's the problem when we start looking at behavior in that arbitrary way, that's yeah. bad behavior, we need to punish it. So I had the secondary kind of trauma from that. And now how, how would I ever go to a teacher and tell them about it? So you get this kind of thing. But then when you when you hear discussions about corporal punishment, so many people are like, oh, I had the cane, it never did me any harm. Right. That there tells you it did you harm. It did do you because harm. You normalized that. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. Uh, and I, yeah, I definitely was a child who got spanked quite a few times, and I can tell you it did harm. Yeah. 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 Well, the hours whiz by. I, we've covered a lot on the, a huge amount tonight, especially looking at. Lots of and you know, I've learned so much from you, uh, Jen, tonight. It's really got my brain thinking about so many things, and, and I'm sure a lot of the, the listeners have kind of done the same. But before we go, what, what are your kind of, um, you know, if you could carve into a into a big tablet your top five considerations with infants and dogs, kids and dogs, the things that you really want everybody to be considerate about, what what would they be? You don't have to have five, by the way, but you know. Okay. The, points that you think you know this is what I need to get on the on my rooftop and, and really make sure that people are aware of yeah I think looking at mutual comfort is is so important to me um and respecting body language um and what is being communicated in a nonverbal way and actually being open to learning more about that nonverbal communication that communication even though it's different from our verbal communication, being open to it, respecting it and being open to learning more about it is, is huge. Like that, that is huge for me. And then always trying to, um, you know, give, honor the exits when needed, you know, honor the choices, giving choices. So those are, those are my, my top ones, I believe. And you know what? They're powerful. And we could put insert here. Yeah. It's a child, human, dog. It's just um uh it's it's they're great kind of measures to kind of live by and to connect with and to feel safe around. In in the group, uh, one of my clients, uh, Elizabeth, shared some she couldn't be here now tonight, sadly, um, but because uh, she's a bit busy, but uh she'll be watching on on uh, on on play that but uh, i went to work with her and her um adult daughter uh who um was uh, a non-verbal communicator mm. uh and with her kind of with her assistance dog um adler and i learned so much from her daughter maddie uh i i with with elizabeth's help because i i had to learn the new language that was in front of me because and it was a rich one jen yeah. Uh, yeah it was a rich one and to learn maddie's amazing sense of humor um yes. uh, and uh, so this is this kind of fits a little bit with um our next uh chat that's uh well one of our next chats coming up with with tasha atwood looking at disability pride month and and thinking about ableism and thinking about the things that we just automatically dismiss because it doesn't fit what we see as being uh, the way that you communicate or the way that you act or the way that you behave and all these kind of things. Right. So finishing on the nonverbal bit is so powerful because, um, uh, and actually, you know, we are a verbal species, but we give away way more with our nonverbal communications than we do with our, with our words, really, for sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, excellent. Good. Um, well, it's been amazing. Uh, I really appreciate uh, tonight, Jen. I, 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 my head's buzzing a little bit now, and I think we need to have you back again, actually, and <laughs> we could deep dive into some other things together. Absolutely. That would be really, really fun. I would look forward to that. Um, well, thank you to Jen. Uh, just to let everybody know, on the 11th, over on Canine Arthritis Management, we've got the amazing Amber Batson we, on their platform talking about pain and fear. 
and the um, neurobiological connections there, Jen. That's going to be oh, brilliant. That's going to be a good one. Um, so check out the CAM page for that. I'll make sure we share it in the group again. Um, on the 19th, we've got Tasha Atwood uh, coming in. Uh, Tasha is going to be uh, sharing with us about the challenges of differently abled professionals, uh, the challenges around from a, both the community as an industry point of view and wider society, and also what we need to be more aware of when supporting our colleagues or clients who are differently abled and uh, you know have different different care and support needs to us. Uh, and then on the 24th, uh, we've got um, Deb Bauer talking about um, deaf and blind dogs and supporting them. And uh, again, how we have to rethink how we communicate, uh, you know, and how we can look at stuff. So there's quite some good chats coming up. Some great comments in the group. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you again, Jen. Any, any final words? No, thank you so much for having me. And those are great topics coming up. I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I'm just so chuffed with the people that want to come and chat in the group. And, uh, you know, I just it's such a great learning opportunity and and also to connect on a personal level, because we've just had a wonderful conversation about all sorts of things uh, in a way that is really accessible and personable and, and people can relate to. That's the beautiful thing about having this type of format. Uh, wonderful. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, and um, yeah, look after yourselves and speak soon. Bye bye.